Good morning, everyone, and we will be continuing our series, um, headlined Redeeming the Time, and this is the second in the series. The first was Building the Foundation. Now that we know that we need a solid rock to stand on, a solid foundation on which our life can be built, the next step is called to be bold. How should we respond to an ever-changing culture, growing intolerant of the biblical worldview? How should we respond? As more people lose hope and strive desperately to find peace in a troubled world, we can find refuge in the name that is above every name, the Alpha and Omega, the one and only true God who was, who is, and is to come. And knowing this for yourself should prepare you to be bold and speak truth, not your truth, the only truth. The church is under attack in the media. In an article I read this week, posted by churchleaders.com, it says the media often resorts to stereotypes when portraying Christians. These stereotypes typically paint Christians as extremists, extremists, ignorant or backward thinking individuals, neglecting the diversity and complexity of the faith. How should we respond to that? We will look into God's word this morning, and our focus will be in the book of Acts, and we will be looking at the disciples that Jesus called and assign them to go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And that's the same assignment given to me and you. To go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Shall we begin with prayer? Heavenly Father, we come before you. Our King, our Creator, our all in all. Our hope for years to come. Our God who reigns in eternity, our God who has promised you will never leave us nor forsake us, our God whose kingdom will reign forever and ever. We bow before you this morning and we ask that you visit us through the reading and hearing of your word. May your Holy Spirit spark in us that revival to speak boldly about the only truth, which is your word, which has existed, which some died for, so that we can have this word to read. Help us in our weakness. Help us in our lack of faith. That Lord, by the time we end, we will be awakened. Charged. Ready to live a life of victory for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So before we read the text that we have, Acts chapter 4, verses 1 to 13. Before we do that, I need to give you a little background to that text so that we can completely understand what was going on at the time. Jesus had told his disciples, I will die, I will resurrect after three days, and I will go and be with my father. But before then, 
I will give you the Holy Spirit. Do not leave. Stay in Jerusalem. I will give you the Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit will empower you. That Holy Spirit will give you the ability to do the task I have assigned you. Fast forward. All these events unfold. Jesus is arrested with, while he's with his disciples. He is taken away. He is accused. He is condemned. He is crucified. The disciples are afraid. If it were you, you would be afraid. Now, picture that world. That world where the Roman Empire was in power. Within Jerusalem, there were different groups that were jostling for power. Everyone trying to find a way to entrench themselves as the power that works closely with the Roman government. And Jesus was seen as a threat to that power. So, for people like the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the chief priests, the high priests, all that group, they felt, now we have done away with that man who was pulling the crowds and trying to gather people to himself. Now there should be peace. That is the era we are going to be reading about. So, the day of Pentecost arrives. The disciples are together. They receive the Holy Spirit. All of this is happening in chapter 2. And they are empowered. Peter who ran away when Jesus was arrested and was brought, he followed first Jesus to the chief priest's house, the courtyard. And when the little girl said, you were with Jesus, he denied Jesus three times. Said, I don't know him. This same Peter, once the Holy Spirit came on Pentecost, he stood up and addressed a multitude. And 3,000 people were saved. On this background, we will now read our text in Acts chapter 4, verses 1 to 13. And as they were speaking to the people, but even before then, so, day of Pentecost had come, 3,000 have been saved, and on one particular day, Peter and John were on their way to the temple for prayer. Hurrying along, they meet this lame man that. Normally, they will put this lame man at the beautiful gate, which is outside the temple, and he will be begging for arms. This lame man asks Peter <clears throat> for money, and Peter responds, silver and gold I don't have, but what I, what I have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Then the man gets healed, begins to walk, follows Peter and John into the temple where they were going to pray. Everybody is shocked. People are wondering, what's happening? What's happening? A miracle? This is, these are not... <laughs> these two people are not the Jesus we know. But they can heal. People are gathering. Now we are talking of the temple. Can you... Um, briefly show the temple so I can yes so the little gate on this side is where the event took place right and then this healed man went into the temple to put Solomon's porch on the other end there which is like a long veranda and that was where Peter took the opportunity to preach the message and 3,000 people were were saved. 
Within this temple courtyard, we have the chief priests, the captain of the temple, the Pharisees, and all those groups of religious leaders. They all operate within there. So you can imagine what's happening. These same people are the ones who planned, had Jesus arrested and killed, so that all that his activities and his followers all will end. Now, completely neutral people come and gather and are preaching and people are listening and people are hearing. You can imagine what will happen. They were not happy. And this is the background to the text we are going to read. So there is confusion. So much is happening there. People are eager to come and see. People are eager to come and hear. And the next is the text we are going to read. So we have a context before we read that. And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Let's pause there. The Sadducees do not believe there is anything like resurrection of the dead. So they had clearly made up their mind, Jesus we have killed, he's gone, and that's it. That's the end of his life. So for two people to come and create some miraculous activity and be assigning it to that same Jesus that they want his history and his whatever to end, that was mind-boggling to them. They were annoyed. Next verse. They arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. You can imagine what would be going on behind the scenes. These are not ordinary people. When you talk of the Sadducees, according to David Peterson in the commentary on the book of Acts, the Sadducean party was made up of chief priests and elders, the priestly and the lay nobility. They do not believe in the resurrection of the dead. They perhaps also taught the apostles' teaching could be politically, socially, and religiously destabilizing to their relatively good relationship with Rome. The same crew, that crew, this same group of people, were the ones who schemed to crucify Jesus. We see that in John chapter 11, <clears throat> verses 45 to 50. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and has seen what he did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests, take note, the Pharisees gathered the council and said, What are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. These religious leaders were also politically inclined. Their desire was not so much about pleasing God. Their desire was so much about entrenching themselves in their positions. If today we are attacked in the world about what we believe, it is the very same thing. People in power want to remain in power and control the public, the populace. And they will do anything to keep us under control. And that is just how the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the chief priests, the high priests, they plotted, they succeeded, they crucified Jesus. They thought that was the end. All of a sudden, two people they check them out and realize this is not Jesus. These seem to be ignorant people, but they are speaking. People are listening, and they seem to have done a miracle. What do we do? I can imagine what they would have done that night. They would have called each other, maybe called the mayor of the city. Hey, 
come together. We've heard there was a gathering in the temple. Call this person. Call that person. Call this person. Call the lawyers. Let's figure out what law we can use to pin them down. Tomorrow we'll be meeting with them. We'll show them where power lies. Make sure we dress up in our original clothes, everything, and come and meet them. I believe that was the plan. Let's go back to our text in, in um, yes. So verse 4, okay. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were in the high priestly family. The whole power broker group gathered. You talk of judges, they were there. Talk of lawyers, they were there. Talk of elders, they were there. Talk of the mayor, they were there. Talk of the high priest, he was there. Everybody was there. They said, now, go and bring those two guys from prison. If you and I fear prison, if you and I fear arrest, for which reason we, we, we just cower to pressure, cower to threats of being imprisoned, then we should begin to ask ourselves, do we know the history of where we come from or where we came from? People sacrificed, stayed in prison, fought from prison for us to have God's word today. We can't choose the easy way out simply because we are threatened that we will be arrested because we are speaking in the name of God. Do we even understand the power behind that name? Do we even understand that? Or we think sometimes, okay, you know, I have my children, I have my family, I must preserve them, I don't need to find myself in any trouble and all of that. The Bible says, he who wants to preserve his life will lose it. You want to preserve your life by protecting yourself? I don't want to be in any trouble. They say we shouldn't speak about God. Okay, I won't. In the schools, don't preach. Okay, don't talk. Don't, in work, don't talk. Don't. Are you sure? Really? Are you sure? Really? We shouldn't speak? Brothers and sisters, people have faced the very same thing. They spoke, and we will see how resilient they were over the period. Arrest, arrest, jail, release, arrest. J that is the history of the church. It hasn't stopped. We should not fear the threats. If there is any power of the enemy, it is in putting fear in us. Fear and lies. If he can manipulate you and make you believe lies, oh, you will be arrested. Oh, I don't want to be arrested, so I stop what I feel God's word is telling me to do. But these people, they know these things. They saw this same group gather arrest Jesus, and have him crucified. They bring them to face that group. I have a picture from the 18th. It says it's, it's uh, the Sanhedrin from an 1883 encyclopedia. That's how they gathered all the people ready. They brought these two guys, Peter and John. Remember the background of Peter and John? They are fishermen. They are coming to meet the scribes. They have the law opened, everything. And the interesting thing is, they ask them the very same question they ask Jesus. Because they know and remember that same question got Jesus in trouble. They ask them, by what power? By what name did you do this? You would think, okay, it's a trick question. How do I answer it so that I stay safe? 
Oh, Peter didn't have time to think of how to be saved. He went straight on and gave them the message and told them the Jesus you killed and crucified, he is risen. He is the only name under heaven by which people will be saved. It is that name, Jesus, that we use, we mentioned, and that person was healed. If it were you, among that group, <laughs> with all your knowledge, <laughs> with all your law, with all your power, you have used that same trick question and got their leader. And you use that question and you are faced straight on with answers you never anticipated. I believe they never anticipated they could face them and tell them the truth right in their faces. You are the ones who killed Jesus. You killed him wrongfully because he is the one and only true God. They couldn't stand it. Let's go back to our text in, 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 in Acts. Yeah. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Remember, the people don't believe in the resurrection of the dead. So if you say it was Jesus, then, oh, you are trying to bring up that name they want to completely annihilate. Then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed? Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. Oh, was there any hesitation as to what they are thinking and what they are saying? Spot on. The next verse. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Verse 13. You can imagine. When they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. The power of the Holy Spirit transforms. The power of the Holy Spirit makes us bold, takes away our fears. When you believe that God is three in one, God the Father, God the Son, Jesus Christ, God the Holy Spirit. When we accept Christ, the Holy Spirit comes to indwell us. How do we feed the Holy Spirit? By reading God's word, which is again knowing about God. Being in communion with God, you are feeding the Holy Spirit. And so, when you have that in you, why should you fear? Why should you fear people who don't have the power of the Holy Spirit in them. Knowing that the God we serve is above all gods, all powerful. When the Sanhedrin meets and they gather and they have a chief priest and they have a high priest and they have a judge, they have all those people. God is in control of them. If he takes away their ability to breathe, all of them will just die right there. If he takes away their ability to think, they will all go crazy. That is the God we serve. But we oftentimes fear because we do not exercise the power God has given to us in our everyday lives. It is not enough for us to come like this and hear God's word 
close our Bibles and come next Sunday. It is not enough. Monday's challenges will come and you need God to guide you. Tuesday's challenges will come. Wednesday's challenges will come. Thursday's challenges will come. And if you are not hearing from God, you will go astray. That's why people who reject God many times are living in a life of hopelessness. Hopelessness. Nothing can replace the hope we have in Jesus Christ. Nothing. Money, wealth, what, what, nothing. And people have all that, yet they feel hopeless. This week, I was privileged to talk to a public organization in town. I was trying to figure out my electric bill set up because we had moved from one house to another. So I called and they asked, okay, when did you move from the old place? I said, oh, I moved 28. They said, no, we have here that you moved 30th. I said, okay. I said, okay. So when did you arrive at the other place? I said, I arrived at 28. They said, oh, we have here, you arrived at 26. I said, okay. So then they asked, what do we do? I said, not a problem. Plus $10, plus $50, plus $1,000, plus whatever it is. I do not bother about those things. Then the lady said, I wish I have what you have. And then I said, you want to know why? He said, I want to know why. I said, I have God Almighty. He controls everything in this world. He controls money. He controls resources. He controls everything. Somebody says, I left two days earlier, two days late, ten days late. How much money? Even if I don't have, my God will provide. I don't worry about things like that. And she said, I wish I had that. I wish, I said, you can have that through Jesus Christ. Surrender your life to him. You will live at peace with yourself. And she said, I wish I had that. That was my opportunity. And the things I want us to challenge us on this morning is that the enemy will constantly be on our case, bringing fear, threats. And when you allow fear to be a part of your life, you won't live your life to the fullest. No way. Because the devil has you strangled there. Oh, this will happen to you. Oh, that will happen to you. Oh, that will happen to you. And research shows that many of the things we worry about never come to pass in the first place. Never comes to pass already. So why, why just spend all of your time doing that? Let's go into our text again. You would think as the <laughs> disciples spoke this way, the people got confused. The whole power structure got confused. They had to take a break. said, we will be back. Keep these people aside. And they went behind closed doors and deliberated and deliberated and deliberated. They saw the crowd they saw that the guy is healed and they asked the question and he said, we use the name of Jesus, the name you don't believe. And they were bold to tell them that Jesus you crucified, he is the Jesus we are mentioning right now. By his name, the guy is healed. They didn't know what next step to do. So they came and said, you know what? Don't mention that name again. Don't preach in that name again. Don't preach in that name again. You know the response of the disciples? They say, Say, judge for yourself. <laughs> they responded to the people, judge for yourself if it is better for us to listen to man or to listen to God. We would rather listen to God, not you. Can you imagine the judges, the mayor of the city, the rulers of the temple, and all of that said, we won't listen to you. We will listen to God. They had no choice but to free them. They were hoping Threatening them would slow them down. Threatening them would make them afraid. But you know what? There is something we're going to learn from these disciples. When they were threatened, they went back. Reported to their crew of believers. Said, this is what happened to us. Last night, we went preaching 
3,000 people were saved, and then we were arrested, put in jail overnight. They brought us this morning. The whole group gathered. Caiaphas was there. The high priest was there. Sahindran was there. All the people were there. I'm sure the others were curious. So what happened? What happened? Oh, we told them Jesus is the one who healed the people. So what did they do? They told us to go and not mention their name again. And I'm sure they started deliberating. So what do we do? They decided to pray. They came together and prayed. And asked God for boldness to speak. When you are threatened, please don't go to your room and cry. Come to the brethren. Let's gather and pray. Because there is power in prayer. They did not only pray that they become bold. They asked for extra. They prayed that they become bold. They pray that God does signs and wonders. Remember, it was one sign that was done and the people got all agitated. They said, we want more signs and wonders. So they get confused even the more. That was their prayer. When you get threatened and you run into your little corner, and you start to send warning signals to people. Have you read that the law says this is that? If you do this, we'll be arrested. We should shut down because this is happening. Have you read the news? Have you read this? Have you read that? That's not what we are supposed to do. No. We are to gather as brothers and sisters in the Lord. Call on God Almighty who controls all things. Who is in charge of this world. Of Steinbach, of Manitoba, of Canada. Of Ghana. Tokyo, everywhere in the world. And he hears us as we call. He knows our problems even before it begins. They pray this prayer. <laughs> you know what happens? <laughs> They're unexpected happens. Let's go to verses, chapter 4, verses 23. So, they were released, they went, they reported to their people, they prayed for boldness, and they continued to speak with boldness. See the signs, see the signs that begin to follow them. Uh, chapter 5, chapter 5, verses 12 to 16. Let's read that. Chapter 5, verses 12 to 16. Now, after they've prayed and done all those things, now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. And they were all together in Solomon's portico. That same spot they were arrested from. They chose to go back there, continue to do more signs and wonders, continue to preach. What do you think that's going to be? What, what do you think that's going to happen? Among the chief priests, the high priests, the Caiaphas, the Sadducees. What do you think is going to happen? Most likely, they will come back after them. They were ready to engage them. And they knew they had the Holy Spirit, God himself within them. They feared nothing. None of the rest dared join them. But the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, more than ever, believers were added to the Lord. Multitudes, multitudes of both men and women. So that even, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Not some. All. What do you think will be happening in the minds and the hearts of the rulers? 
complete confusion. The number is growing. The people are defying our warning. They are still in the temple court. They are teaching. They are preaching. They are healing. Miracles are happening. The last time we asked them, they said it was Jesus' name they are mentioning. So now what's the next move? When we grab them, how do we question them? How do we corner them so that we stop them from doing these things? That was their plan. Chapter 5, verse 17. Chapter 5, verse 17. It says, By the high priest rose up, and all who were with him, and were filled with jealousy. Now the numbers are growing. You can't stop them. They've told you how they are operating. You've asked them before, and they are still doing it, and the numbers are growing. What's the next step? You are jealous. You are the ruling party or you have an alliance with the ruling party. You want to maintain your stance. Maybe this is a new political party being formed, hidden under a religious something. How do we stop them? How do we stop them? That was their mind. Verses 18. They arrest them again. They arrest them again from Solomon's portico. And they put them in prison. That's verse 18. They put them in prison at night in anticipation that the next day they will gather again. And this time, probably different strategy. We won't ask them what name. We already know the name. We will have to pin them to something different. And they were in the prison. And God sent an angel. Prison doors are open. They are directed. Directed where? Go back to the temple. Same spot. Go, same spot. Don't change. Go and be there and preach. So the Sanhedrin, the high priest, the chief priest, all of the group, they'd gone to bed, planning, hatching, all that stuff. Knowing that in the morning, we'll go and bring them from prison they will face us, and this time, we'll nail them. Day breaks. He sends the guards. Go bring the people. The guards go to the prison. There's nobody. There is nobody in the prison. Then someone comes to tell them, Oh, are you looking for those disciples? They are at Solomon's portico. They are preaching. Same thing. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the boldness and how it will make the leaders feel, my brothers and sisters, when you are opposed as a believer, you must cry out to God for boldness to speak because there's power in God's word. There is power in God's word because God's word tells us in Isaiah 55, 10 and 11, it says, God's word does not go forth and come back in vain. It is like a seed to the sower. So sometimes when you speak God's word, a seed will be planted in someone's life. A seed will be planted. And anything that is planted, once it's watered, it will grow. And then, same verse likens God's word to bread for the eater. God's word is like bread to the eater. So when you speak God's word into somebody's life, it feeds them. So when you and me decide not to speak, we are not planting, we are feeding nobody. And ourselves, when we fail to read, we are not feeding, we will not grow, we will only wither we will only be semblance of living things, living and thriving. But the reality of who we are, as God sees us and sees our heart, He knows we are living yet dead. That is why when I see the announcement that the men are planning, are planning to gather here 6 a.m. on Wednesdays 
for coffee, to pray and just think through things and read God's word. I said, that's it. That is it. That is just what is needed. If you can leave your home and come and spend time with the brothers and pray. The time Peter and John were heading to the temple, it was for prayer. But listening to the Holy Spirit, from all the accounts we have read, they didn't go for any prayer meeting. They ended up doing a miracle. They turned it into a preaching opportunity. Speak God's word whenever the opportunity comes. Don't get glued and tied into religiosity. This is what we've planned to do. That's all we are going to do. No, this is not the time for prayer. This is not. No, no, no. As God leads, move with the leading. So when the Holy Spirit is not active in a church, the church looks active but is dead. When the Holy Spirit is not functioning in your life, you look alive but dead. When the storms of life come, you shake, 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 thrown out. You have no base. You have no foundation. And it does not cover me, a pastor, or even my colleague pastor. If we refuse to read God's word and pray, we will equally wither. We will only feed you chaff. Irrelevant stuff. Things that have no value. Fast forward, these people are brought before the group again. Verses 28, they say, We strictly charge you not to teach in this name. Yet here you are, filled Jerusalem with your teaching. And you intend to bring this man's blood on us. Now they are afraid. They are now afraid, saying, this teaching, this preaching, these miracles, it looks like you want to bring that Jesus man's blood on us. They are afraid. God's power is above every power. Nothing should hinder you from coming to him and crying out to him to help you in any situation. And I'll address this to my young people. You are in school. You are engaged with people who don't know God who don't care about God, they talk anyhow, they behave anyhow, be bold to speak truth. And it's not your truth. It is the only truth. When they say, oh, that's your truth, say, no, 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 that's the only truth, whether you think it is or not. That's the only truth in the world that I know. And I'm speaking it as I know it. May we be active. May we be known for what we stand for. People should like us. People don't like us. That's not a problem. God loves us just the way we are. Because he has a plan and a purpose for our lives to reach out to the world that is not saved. Peter's response in chapter 5, verse 29. Same response he gave them the first time. He says, we will rather obey God than you people. You, this squad over here, we will obey you. We will obey God. What will your response be when you are told you can't teach, you can't preach, you can't speak God's word, you can't pray? What will your response be? What will my response be? Let us as workers in our workplaces be attentive to the people around us because God's word says that by the love we show people we will know we are his disciples. Being attentive to another person's problem, being there to hear them, being there to pray for them, indicates we care about them. Some may say, don't pray for me, but I've not had anybody that I've offered to pray for. Say, don't pray for me, don't pray for me. No, I don't like prayers. Take your prayers away. No, I've not seen that. Maybe you have seen that. I've not seen that. Somebody's struggling, you can ask, can I pray for you? Can I pray for you? Pray for them. Pray for them. Let them know you care about them. If there is something you can physically do, do it. These people prayed for boldness. They prayed for the ability to do the miraculous. Are we even bold enough to pray for the miraculous? Are we even bold? Are we even bold? Let's begin to pray for such things. And expect God to answer. When they were praying, they didn't know what would happen. All they knew was God had told them, ask me of anything and I will do it. 
And when I do it, people will know you are my disciples. That's the only belief they had and stepped into that. A couple of things for us to remember as we end. The Holy Spirit is the power that transforms. The Holy Spirit is the power that transforms. Not your experience. Not your knowledge. Not your abilities. Not your qualification. Not your network. It's the Holy Spirit that has the power to transform. And so, in any situation, and every situation, when you cry out to God, be specific and saying, Lord, empower me. Feel me that I can discern when you speak. So you move in the power of the Holy Spirit, not in your skills, because your skills can't cut it. Your experience can't cut it. What experience did Peter and John have? Almost none. What skills did they have? Almost none. But when they spoke, <laughs> the educated were confounded, confused. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. The next thing I want us to remember is religious people and secular leaders are typically against believers. Religious people. I didn't say Christians. Religious people. Because there are other religions. And secular leaders are normally against believers. And we saw it in that text. Why? The way of the world is completely contrary to the way of God. Contrary. People will lie to get ahead. Believers believe that we should be truth bearers. All of the things of the world, oftentimes for people who are in authority, is to preserve their power, preserve their position. And so whatever way they can do that, that's the way they will approach it. Let's not be surprised when they make rules aimed at confining our beliefs and our practices. It's been an age-long, old skill they've been using. Oh, to neutralize you, don't preach in that name. Don't mention that name. Don't teach in that name. Jesus' time. It is still happening now. It's not new. Let's not be saddled by that. Three, take any and every opportunity you get to spread the gospel in words and in deeds. They were on their way to prayer. They abandoned the prayer because there was a need. The Holy Spirit led them. They did their miracle and all of that. Fourth, ministry is done in teams. It's not a solo business. No solo business in ministry. Oh, I'm the boss. I know more than everybody and this and that. It's irrelevant. Peter and John, when they were attacked, they went back to their crew. They prayed together and they unleashed God's power. When we read that text, it says, when they prayed, their place shook. When the Holy Spirit is at work, that's what happens. The next thing we can learn from this text is we should rather obey God than man. We must be consistent in our response to opposition and pray for boldness. Let's watch Samuel Lamb. We will finish with two, two um, testimonies. Samuel Lamb was a Chinese believer who came to Christ at age 19, and he started a home church in China, underground church, where you stay underground and you're preaching, and he was arrested because he refused to register his church with the Chinese government. And if a church registers with the government, what do you expect the government to do? To control how you do. You can't preach this, you can't say this, you can only meet on this day, you can only meet for one hour. He says he will not do it because of that. They arrested him. They jailed him for 16 months. They released him. He came back and continued from where he left off. Same location, same place, same gathering, and the people, the numbers grew. From the little number, now he was hitting 900. Then they arrested him a second time. And they kept him for 20 years. 
When he went to jail, he was preaching to the, the prison guards. He was preaching to the prisoners. And they were giving their lives to Christ. 20 years he was in there doing all that. They released him. He came back, same spot, same location, continued the preaching. The church expanded, 3,000. And he says, the more the persecution, the more the growth. Can we watch that um, clip of someone else? They said I was uh, an anti-revolutionist because I preached the gospel and I don't want to register with the government church. Therefore, they said I was an anti-revolutionist. I, I, I went to prison twice, uh, 1990 confiscation. Uh, we were in Damajan, 1990, over 60 PSP, you know PSP? Public Security Bureau. All in uniform. Close our church. Call me to the government hall. Talk to me 21 hours. I slept only a few minutes. But they slept by turn. In the midnight, a PSP talked to me alone. All slept, nobody. He asked me, is there really a God? Oh, that's my chance. I preached to him. He called me Uncle Lamb. You know, PSB never call Mr. Mrs. Only call your name. But I preached to him, he called me Uncle. Not only once, twice, but the whole night. Before 1990, 900. After they close our church, people come back, come back up to 2,000. We moved four years ago from 2,000 to 3,000. More persecution, more growing. That's the history of the church. Also the history of our church. We are not reading the book of Acts. That is a real somebody we can see, we can read about, we can engage. So sometimes when you read God's word and say, oh, that was in the book of, who is Peter, who is Paul, I don't know them. That's a human being you can know. You can read about. You can learn from. They are the living testimonies of what God can do. If God can use him, he can use me, he can use you, he can use us. And I want us to take a moment and reflect on the life of William Tyndale. The Bible we have today, he, William Tyndale, lived for only 42 years of his life, was born in a middle-class family, brilliant young man, who speak eight languages, learned eight languages, academically sharp, did his first degree, did his master's, and his concern because of his ability to speak many languages could read the Greek Bible and felt, no, people who are believers should be able to read God's word by themselves and understand it. Nobody should hide it from them. He took it upon himself to translate the Bible. And at the time, it was a criminal offense to translate the Bible into English in England. Because of that, he left England, went to Germany, spent all his time, translated the Bible, had it smuggled into England for people to have it. When that was found out, he got arrested. They put him on a pole. They used a rope and strangled him to death. But before then, he, he made one statement to the king. And his statement was, God opened the eyes of the king. And that prayer was answered four years after, where the king was the one who now authorized the Bible to be translated into English and shared. People gave their lives so we can have God's word. We don't read it. Somebody believes so much to give his life that we can have it. We don't care. May God touch our hearts to become soft 
to be obedient to his word. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the many people who have gone before us to sacrifice their life, sacrifice their time for the purposes of spreading the good news. Through them, I too, from far away Ghana, can hear your word. All the way from Jerusalem, your word has spread throughout the world. Holy Spirit, may we be bold. Grant us that desire to speak for you. Speak about you. Lord, give us the ability to do the miraculous. Father, may there be healing, wonders, miracles in our congregation and among our people that we can testify of your goodness, of your mercy, which is above all. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.